one. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition with the Southeastern Sports Network. Uh, another great uh, evening podcast sitting down with you. We're talking about the 2023 line football season that's getting underway and uh, a little bit different take tonight. We're excited to have uh, a special guest joining us. I'm Robbie Rhodes in here as always, along with the Voice of the Lions, Mark Willoughby, Harris Beal, uh, Alan Waddell shortly. And then a uh, special guest this week is Sam Herter. Sam is one of the big biggest and the best writers about FCS football in the country. He writes for Hero Sports and also does work for Bet MGM. Sam, thanks a lot for being with us tonight. It means a lot that you join us and uh, have a chance to visit with you. I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me on. Sam, uh, I'm going to open up to you real quickly first here. Um, just talk about uh, you know what you write for Hero Sports. You're also a voting member in the stats poll each and every week. And uh, talk about um, – you know, what you do at BetMGM, we want to hear about all your stuff that you do throughout the year uh, to cover FCS football. Yeah, so my uh, FCS coverage kind of started back in 2011, 2012, uh, when I was a student at NDSU, um, and that was kind of my introduction to uh, to the FCS. And after graduating um, in 2015, kind of went the, the journal, journalism routes uh, through newspapers and magazines, but still kind of wrote about the FCS here and there. Um, but then I was got the opportunity with Hero Sports to come on full-time um, and cover the FCS starting in 2018. I um, mean, I've been with Hero Sports ever since uh, covering the FCS uh, nationally year-round, which is really, really rewarding. Uh, the Bet MGM side of things is more so um, – Hero Sports was kind of a startup company. And then as we grew, uh, the owners there decided to sell to a bigger company. Um, and BetMGM came in and, and bought Hero Sports. And so Hero Sports is basically a, a college football affiliate site with BetMGM. You know, I don't necessarily do anything BetMGM specific. I'm still doing my same thing with Hero Sports. It's just, you know, under some new ownership in the la over the last few years. That's great. That's great. Um well, we're going to dive into it. Obviously, we're going to talk Southeastern. We're going to talk some Southland Conference with you in the landscape of FCS football. Uh, I'm going to open up a question that I have to start, and then I'm going to kind of divvy it out to the guys. I know Alan Waddell just joined us, uh, Sam, so happy to have him on. But, um, you know, we had another roller coaster summer with uh, conference realignment. Uh, we've had a lot of teams. Southeastern <laughs> played one of them last year in Jacksonville State. Former member of Sam Houston State uh, has gone to that FBS route. Um what do you see the landscape of SCS look like, looking like in the next five to 10 years? I mean, I guess people kind of wonder, like, are the buys and the Jackrabbits, the Grizzlies, are they are they looking to position themselves into another league that's below the what we now think of Power Five? And does that become FCS? How do you see that uh, going in, uh, you know, with the teams that are currently left and the teams who were here who were dominant who just recently left? Yeah, I mean, realignment, of course, has dominated the conversation with with the power of five and then into the group of five. But even even in the FCS, you know, realignment is a, you know, a huge talking point in the FCS because some of those FCS to FBS move ups. Um, you, you talk about North Dakota State and South Dakota State. I think they're positioning themselves behind the scenes to make that jump if the opportunity ever comes. But as you know, most know by now that the FBS just isn't calling NDSU because it's in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, no offense to Fargo, North Dakota. I, you know, I live there, but it's just, it, it's on an <laughs> Island. Same thing with Brookings. And it, and it seems like that uh, the, the most of the FCS to FBS movement has gone on, you know, in the more Southern, uh, Southern based of, um, of the FCS. And so will it ever trickle up to the Northern part of the FCS? You know, we'll see if the Mountain West ever needs to add and if they would look at a team like Montana, Montana State or NDSU. Uh, but right now, it seems like, um, you know, that that realignment trickle down isn't hitting the northern part of the FCS. And, you know, as far as what what Division One football looks like, it, you know, that's tough to say. There's always that talk of the power five split. And if that does happen, maybe the 50 to 60 group of five teams that are left, maybe they merge with the top 20 teams in the FCS and create their own 24 team bracket, their own uh you know subdivision with the national tournament um in a national championship but i know this that talking point is more in the fcs than the group of five because the group of five is gonna hang on to the power five as long as they can because that's where the money's at so um, i don't know where things are gonna go but uh i think the there, there's always gonna be room for the fcs whatever it's called um you know cost effective way of playing division one football where you don't have to put in uh, you know a bunch of money into your football programs um the fcs is always going to be around just what specifically it looks like membership wise um i think is is up in the air well that's great that's a really good landscape uh, mark you, you have some questions to open up with harris 
And uh, uh, Mark, we'll start with you. Yeah, let's, let's dive into the Southland Conference. Uh, obviously, that's the conference we know in these parts, these neck of the woods. And uh, Southland, obviously, the, the new alignment with uh, ASUN and uh, what that WAC configuration is. We know a lot of those schools. But talk about the Southland. What, what is your opinion, overall opinion uh, coming into 2023? Who are you looking forward to seeing play? Uh, where do you think the Southland fits right now on a national scale? Yeah, heading into the, this upcoming season for the Southland, it does seem like, you know, those two top teams, which are Southeastern um, and Incarnate Word, have separated themselves from the rest of the pack. Um, I, I think we've seen that, especially over the last couple of years with Nichols, who we saw in the playoffs, what, three years in a row in the late 2010s. Uh, they've they've taken, you know, a, a step back over the last couple of years. Um, and so for me, I really like those top two with UIW and Southeastern, uh, two teams I expect to be back in the playoffs. Who that third team is, I don't know. I like what Texas A&M Commerce did last year. Uh, they do do lose a decent amount of, uh, amount of talent. Um, always kind of looking at McNeese as like, when are they going to, you know, rise back up? Just so much tradition and pride at that school. Um, but, you know, there's hasn't been a whole lot of stability uh, at the top for McNeese. And so maybe they can bubble up to be that top three. But um, I kind of think the Southland, like it has been over the last couple of years, is a two-bid league. Uh, the Southeastern UIW game will probably once again determine, you know, the out of bit out of that conference, but whoever doesn't lose that game, um, you know, I was doing game by game predictions and I think UIW and Southeastern will, will hit at least eight division one wins, which, which should get them both in, back to, uh, excuse me, back into the postseason bracket. Kind of leads me to another question. Uh, you know, this neck of the woods, I think you realize just due to geography, we have to play a lot of uh, FBS up games and we have two this year and had two last year. We've had two many years, but in your opinion, I know you're, you're a national voter. Uh, what is your outlook on teams that play multiple FBS? Uh, obviously, it's automatic two losses just about every time. And uh, for most uh, FCS teams, unless you're fortunate enough to pull off the big upset. But uh, when do you decide to you know penalize a team for playing those two FBS games? Yeah, that's, that's the tough balance because I do have Southeastern ranked. Uh, I can't remember specifically somewhere in, in the mid-teens, I, I want to say. And Southeastern is likely to start 0-2, but do you bump them out for losing to an FBS top 25 Mississippi State team and then maybe one of the best G5 teams in South Alabama? Like you said, that's probably two losses. You know, I'm not going to bump Southeastern out on my top 25 because they're 0-2, but if there's a team that's maybe number 19 and they have a really, really impressive win, it's like, okay, I kind of – they had a really good win there. I, I should probably bump them into my top 15, and that naturally – bump southeastern back a little bit which when you focus singularly on where the lions are ranked and you see them bump back in the polls maybe a little bit because they have those two fbs losses that doesn't seem fair and i get that but there are times like i mentioned where some teams just deserve to maybe to move back up um it's it's i think i think it was earlier this week i wrote it when i was doing the game by game predictions for the lions um that i said scheduling two fbs opponents while i understand for some athletic departments that's that's really important because that's close to a million dollars in guaranteed money. I do think it is overall a disservice to the players. Um, I do know that players really do like playing FBS opponents, you know, a chip on their shoulder. And so I get that part of it, but you do take away opportunities to stack up division one wins on your playoff resume where, you know, let's say instead of scheduling South Alabama, uh, SLU schedules, you know, a team from the, from the ACE on WAC or the United Athletic Conference, and they can get a win there. Now, all of a, all of a sudden, instead of eight and three, they're nine and two. And that just, you know, helps their playoff committee or the play, helps the playoff committee kind of gauge them a little bit better. I know Alan yeah. has some thoughts on that. Uh, Alan, uh, I know you, you're a big fan of the FBS games. That's a joke, but. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it, it's tough. You know, I'm, I'm always on a soapbox saying, you know, it, it's hard to, you know, the teams that won in the playoffs play at home. And, you know, we've been in the playoffs three out of the last four years. But, um, you know, we've won three home games and we've lost three road games. So, you, you got to get those home games in the playoffs. And it's just tough when you're having to go out and play those two FBS games. Sam, I do want to ask you, you know, uh, this has kind of been Walter Payton country down here. You know, the last few years, Cole Kelly, obviously, for us. And then Lindsey Scott last year for UIW. Uh, you know, how, how does the, the rest of the country, you know, view what's going on down here as far as offense? I mean, there's been a lot of points scored in the Southland conference uh, the last several years. Yeah, I think the the Southland is, is one of the more entertaining game, uh, conferences to watch week in and week out because of those high powered um, offenses. And uh, you know, there was uh, th those battles between 
between Cole Kelly, uh, you know, and Cameron Ward going back a couple of years ago. Um, I just remember in the spring and the fall season, just crazy, crazy statistics, fun to watch. And so um, I, I think from a national perspective, I mean, it's kind of twofold because like I said, you, you always want to tune into uh, the Southland games, especially if it does involve um, SLU or UIW because they're, they are routinely in the playoff picture, routinely ranked. And so you're always watching those games and you know, you're in for some special quarterback play and some, great running backs, uh, still really good offensive line play as well. Um, obviously really good wide receivers. Uh, but on the flip side of that is we talk a lot about style of play and what it takes to win a national title. And of course the, the standard now is, is South Dakota States um, and North Dakota state is there as well. And they play a different brand, uh, you know, a, a football. And some of that is, you know, location and, and weather and, and all of that. But um, I think when it comes to the big picture wise, Overall, beating teams 52 to 42 is fun, but it's not a formula for playoff success. Um, and you can't win shootout after shootout when it comes to the postseason. And so um, I think overall the Southland um, is strong, really good offensively, but just need to see more uh, defensively uh, for for a team to kind of emerge as a national title threat. And I, I thought UIW's defense was really talented last year. Um, and we saw that with Sam Houston, um, you know, actually as well, a couple of years ago. Um, I know they, they, they've moved on since, but we saw them really um, emphasize the defensive side of the football, um, get bigger up front, and that resulted in the, the spring national championship. Yes, yeah. Sam, and, and, you know, the other point uh, about that is the fact that, you know, our coaching staff has really gone out and they're trying to schedule those national games. You know, you look at our schedule this year. We're going out to Eastern Washington. They're going to come here to Hammond next year. Also, South Dakota State is going to come down here to Hammond next year as well. Uh, and then we'll return that trip in a few years. But, you know, d does that – I'm sure that's got to give some weight to, a, you know, when you're looking at programs saying, hey, these guys are out trying to play other teams from around the country in their scheduling. Yeah, I, I do think that's huge because when it comes to uh, the playoff pitcher and – uh, seeds and at large bids and who's on the bubble. Um, I'm a big proponent of, of strength, strength of schedule, uh, just because, you know, how do you stack up um, a, a New Hampshire and a Weber state? If there's no crossover games, like how do you, unless you're really into it and X's and O's like you just, it's hard to know who's better. And so sometimes the playoff committee will, um, will look at strength of schedule and who they played and who they beat and all that. And, you know, the Southland, like I said, I think the top is strong, but you know, the bottom of the Southland isn't as strong. And if you are SLU or UIW, you can't help who you play in your conference. But if, you know, Southeastern or UIW are at eight wins, nine wins, and they're being compared to, a nine win team out of the big sky and the big sky, that big sky team has a strength of schedule ranked number 12 in the country. And maybe UIW, their strength of schedule is, you know, a number 50, the playoff committee does look at that. And so long, long answer is, is scheduling tougher in um, it, against top tier FCS opponents is such a great gauge uh, for us. And it also helps the program because, you know, I, I've heard coaches say after they've played a team like NDSU in the playoffs, they've, they've said, okay, we've seen it up close and personal. We see where we need to get to. We see, you know, the depth we need, the play we need in the trenches. We see that up close and personal. And now we know the type of players and the type of bodies we need. And so I just think it's super helpful to schedule tough like that. Good point, Sam. And I'll say that because we played Montana in 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, Coach Selfo left there and said, we got to look like those guys. I mean, that was something he took out of there as a quote. I think we've all heard a million times and he's tried to get to that point. Um, I want to hit back some something quickly that I asked in the first question to you. You're really in tune with the, the, the South Coast State folks, the North Coast State folks, Montana, Montana State. They, they've seen the JMUs, the Sam Houston, the Jacksonville State, these teams leaving. Um, are those fans and those administrations saying, that's fine, they can do that, we're going to continue to do our thing, or are they saying, are we getting left behind? I, I know you kind of answered that a little bit in your opening statement with us and talking about that, but what are the what are the what are those camps thinking um, with what they're seeing their their former uh, rivals, I guess you'd say, for the playoffs do, doing? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. And I think with those four North Dakota State, South Dakota State, Montana State and Montana, I think it's a mixed bag. Um, I think the Bison are more than ready to go to uh, the FBS. You know, they just need uh, that invite, which is which has yet to come. Um, and, you know, Mountain West would be a dream for NDSU, the American you know, more central time zone base would, would also be 
a dream scenario. Uh, you know, the Mac a couple of years ago when all the realignment was going on and, and should we add, should we not add what's going on? The Mac didn't show any interest in NDSU, um, you know, conference USA, if push came to shove and NDSU got an invite from conference USA, I think they would consider it, but you know, conference USA is arguably not as good as, is the Missouri Valley football conference. And they also play games on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and NDSU fans travel from four hours away all across the mid, all across Minnesota, North Dakota. So, you know, I, I don't know if, if they would take that invite, but um, it is something where they would strongly consider. And as odd as it sounds, the more NDSU wins, the more fans are jumping on the FBS wagon of we need to go. And I think behind the scenes, NDSU administrated administrators, they, they want to go FBS more and more. They're not absolutely dead set on going FBS uh, like a Eastern Kentucky and a Austin P who have come out and said, yeah, in Missouri state, yeah, we're going to be FBS in a few years. They're, they're, they're holding their cards really tight, but I think you mentioned those teams that have left and you can make the argument of, well, why would NDSU want to go up? They can keep on just winning national titles. Well, that was the argument five, six, seven years ago, but N NDSU can't even sell out semifinal games anymore. I mean, NDSU, you know, 75% of their, of their athletic budget is coming from support. It's not allocated from student fees or, or the government or the state of North Dakota. Uh, they rely on ticket revenue and boosters and, um, and, and, and donor support and stuff like that. Well, when the fan bases won't even come to your, when the fans won't, won't come to your semifinal games anymore, because, well, we've seen this, we've done that. We've beaten all these teams. What else is, what else is out there? You know, that's a problem. So that's why I think NDSU is, is seriously, working toward it but again if no invite comes they can't do anything i think south Dakota state isn't there yet uh montana state montana I, they they have a lot of old school fans that still love the fcs even though it doesn't look like it did in in 2000s that are still i think holding on to the fcs um but i think maybe they're leaning a little bit more toward hey if the fbs comes calling you know it's probably our time to to make that jump i know harris you had a question for sam as well go ahead hey sam uh you know looking at the last year and playoffs and going forward this year do you have any two do you have two teams that are going to be like big surprisers this year that are going to take a huge step back in your opinion and do you have two teams that you think are going to come out of nowhere and kind of surprise the nation and making a run yeah i think one team on the radar is, is holy cross uh you know they, they play in the patriot league which is not known as, as a strong uh, FCS conference, but you look at last year's playoffs and the team that actually played South Dakota state, the toughest was Holy cross. Uh, it was 21, 21 heading into the fourth quarter before the Jacks pulled away. Uh, I really like Sluka uh, coming back, uh, Matthew Sluka quarterback coming back for Holy cross. And so I think they have an opportunity to take a, a big step forward. Uh, William and Mary as well, I think is, is primed to take another big step forward. You know, Furman is kind of in that camp as well. Uh, a team that brings back a majority of their roster from last year that, I think are in Furman actually Furman and Idaho are kind of the two preseason darlings. Um, obviously the Lions beat Idaho uh, last year, but uh, Idaho has big time offensive firepower coming back and what they did under Jason X first year. Um, I think the expectations are that they can make an even uh, bigger jump um, in this second season. As far as teams that uh, take a step back, um, I don't know if anyone's going to drastically jump back, but I, I do wonder about Weber state and Sac state uh, teams that have lost uh, their, their head coaches that were such a big part of their program. And so possibly they take um, a step back. I do think a team like Elon that made the playoffs last year, won't be in the playoffs this year. Um, and so those, those are just a few teams that might, you know, rise up and down in, in the FCS. Mark, go ahead with a question. Well, you, you mentioned Sluka at Holy Cross earlier. Who are your Peyton candidates this year? Who do, who do you think are, are fitting that top three, top four, top five, maybe hey, top ten even, uh, if you have that many? Yeah, Sluka is up there. You know, he's a, he's a dual threat guy, um, can pass it and can throw it. Uh, Michael Hires, I think, is set for um, a huge season. He's a, the quarterback for Samford. Um you know, it, it's 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 such a quarterback heavy award. I think the last time a non-quarterback won was in twenty. 
2015 or 2016, and that was Cooper Cup. So it's easy to name, <laughs> uh, you know, a bunch of quarterbacks. Um, I think uh, Zach Calzada at UIW, it's tough to put him up there now because he hasn't played an FCS snap, but he seems primed for um, a big year. Uh, Hayden Hatton at Idaho, he's a wide receiver. Um, I think he's up there as well. He'll put up big numbers. Uh, and then Isaiah Davis, if I have to name a running back, it would probably be Isaiah Davis from South Dakota State. Uh, I've heard fourth round potential next year in the NFL draft. Uh, it's just a matter of how many touches – uh, you know, he gets, he might not put up gaudy numbers because they spread the ball around. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of Peyton voters are going to look at those numbers and, and base their vote off of that. Um, and so I think if I had to put money on it, I would probably say Michael Hires from Sanford is the favorite going into it. That is most likely going to win it. If he repeats what he did last year. I was going to put the numbers up. No question mm -hmm. on offense, flip side of the ball, uh, defensively uh, Buchanan award. Who do you see as the top players this year? Yeah, Jacob Dobbs, uh, Holy Cross, uh, is an absolute beast, the middle linebacker there. Um, you know, he missed most of last season with an injury, uh, but, you know, he he had a huge 2021 season. Uh, I really like David Walker from Central Arkansas, uh, defensive end there, put up massive numbers last year. Um, you know, it seems, you know, again, it, it it's hard for, def uh, for defensive backs uh, to win this award because, you know, you could you could have – you know, two interceptions and five pass breakups and a quarterback doesn't throw your way the rest of the year at a cornerback and you're absolutely shut down, uh, shutting down your side of the field. And I know Southeastern has had some really good cornerbacks um, in, in recent years. It's, you know, numbers wise, it's it's easy to look at tackles for loss and, and sacks. And so um, that's why I think a, a guy like David Walker has a good shot. Uh, John Pius uh, and Nate Lynn from William and Mary, Josiah, uh, Josiah Silver, another defensive end from uh, New Hampshire. You know, those are guys that just get after the quarterback and, you know, like 16 sacks and 21 tackles for loss. Those are the type of numbers that kind of jump off the page. Um, and they're pro prospects too. You know, it's not like they're just going up against, you know, bad teams. I mean, John Pius is getting serious NFL draft uh, consideration as well. So these guys are, ta are talented. They, it's not like they're just, you know, stacking up numbers. They are, you know, talented guys. And so I think, and I try to look beyond just the numbers. I, you know, I, I watch all these guys and, and try to, you know, base it off of their play and who they're going up against and, you know, some PFF mm -hmm. statistical numbers and, and also the stat sheet numbers as well. Kind of mix all that into, to form my vote. Hey, Sam, I see all those uh, passes behind you. You know, what's uh what's on the schedule this year? What's what's a big game you're going to? How much do you get out? How much do you travel? Yeah, I I usually get to two or three games uh, a year. I am based out of Minneapolis, and so there's not a ton of schools within a driving distance of me. Um, and, you know, obviously flying, you know, costs money and hotel stay and all that. And so I have to make it, you know, worth it from a, a Twitter engagement and, of, of course, online page views if I'm writing about that game that I'm at. And it has to – you know, be worth it. And so uh, I've, I've gone to a couple of Brawl the Wild games between Montana and Montana State because those those two fan bases eat up any coverage about their team. And so I always know if I go there, um, you know, it's going to play well. Uh, I might go to Idaho uh, this year just because their fan base is just – eating up any coverage about their team because they are getting so much hype. Uh, they play both Montana schools in October. So that is one I'm, I'm possibly looking at getting to, uh, but for the most part, you know, honestly, when you're trying to cover a subdivision of 128 teams, you of course can't watch every single game, but you want to watch, uh, every game that involves either a top 25 team or a team that's in the playoff picture. And the easiest way to do that is to have multiple TVs going um, in my office and just watch as many games as possible. And when I'm in the press box, you know, you watch the game you're at and maybe you put on one on your computer, but you know, that's all you can really do. And so it, it's honestly a lot easier to get a national gauge uh, when I, when I'm just at home, but at the same time, you still want to see these, these players and coaches I'm mean, up close and personal when you can. And so I, I try to make it out to some, a few games every year. I get, you, I get you down to the Barry at some point down here in Hammond. Get you to do a game down here. Yeah, I, it's, yeah that, that's the thing, too. I'm, I'm more Midwest-based, uh, which is kind of natural, but at the same time, I do know I, I should probably spread out and uh, go to a game more south or more east instead of, you know, a more uh, Midwest-based uh, base school. Harrison, the yeah. cooking club will take care of you. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, yeah. That's Dan right. Uh, the UCA player. What is the landscape in, college, in uh, FCS football from the fans you're, you're hearing from, the committee, making of this A-Sun whack situation? And they've lost some teams here recently, the FBS. Uh, when you talk about Sam Kennesaw, I mean, what what's, what is that looking like nationally in your mind? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the biggest disruptors 
to Division One football in realignment. You could argue that the ASUN forming a football conference and then the WAC reforming their football conference that maybe had the biggest impact because, uh, you know, the ASUN and the WAC were originally going to do their own things. And then they swooped into, uh, you know, to the, to the Southland and um, a little bit into the big sky and into the, the big South, the OVC to form their football leagues. And, you know, the, the Southland was left gutted for a little bit before getting some teams back, you know, the big South and the OVC were left gutted. They had to form their own joint league between the big South and the OVC. But then just as they were adding, between the ASUN and the WAC, you know, that you, you had a couple of teams leave there in Jacksonville state and Sam Houston. And so now, now the ASUN WAC, they, they've formed and now they're, they're now they're the uh, United athletic conference. Um, you know, they're a joint conference and that they have a conference auto bid into the FCS playoffs, but the NCAA doesn't recognize them as an official F, an official NCAA conference, uh, which is the most confusing three sentences I said in a row, but that's, you know, that's kind of where things are at with, with the United Athletic Conference. Um, and, you know, they, the big storyline with them is that, you know, they've had a couple of unnamed sources come out to ESPN and say they, they plan on going to the FBS as a whole, which I know a lot of FCS commissioners push back on. And then, you know, you, the UAC leaders kind of stepped back on that and said, well, you know, we, we, we have high aspirations and we would like to go to the FBS, but we know that's not likely. And so our focus is just to become an FCS conference. Um, but there's no doubt that there's a lot of teams in that conference that would like to go to the FBS one day. Um, and they might have a pathway to do so if conference USA ever decides to add, but as far as that conference as a whole, jumping up to the FBS, that's just not going to happen because that's going to create a pipeline where, you know, the SWAC or the, the big sky or the Missouri Valley say, well, if those teams can go, why can't we go? If you let them in, you have to let us in. And I, it's, that, that would just create a, a big mess in my opinion. Mark. All right, Sam, uh, put you on the spot here. Uh, might have to think about this a little bit, but give me a hot take for 2023, uh, something maybe out of left field for you. And also a hot take five, 10 years down the road. What, what do you, is there something uh, deep in your gut that you feel might come to pass this year and then down the road? Yeah, um, a hot take for this year, and it's actually, it, it's it's a hot take on the surface, but if you, you know, if you're really paying attention, especially up north, it's probably not that hot of a take, but I think South Dakota State is going to have a higher uh, average attendance for home games over North Dakota State this year, uh, which seems wild, but I do think it's it's very realistic, and part of that is the home draws for both, but I mean, South Dakota State, their, their fan base is you know, they're doing huge numbers and huge engagement and their, ba their fan base is basically what North Dakota state was, was like in 2013, where they're just, we're at the top of the FCS. This is awesome. And then NDSU, I already talked about them, but they're, you know, a lot of their fans are hoping for, for something new. Um, and so they're, they're kind of less and less engaging with FCS content. Uh, as far as big picture wise, you know, 10 years from now, um, man, I, I would say that in, this is going to be a hot take because I don't think it is going to happen, but um, I would really hope for that the the FCS can negotiate its own TV deal. Um, that's a whole different podcast as far as the terrible uh, TV deal the NCAA signed with ESPN back in 2012 that is worth like $33 million a year for all sports outside of uh, men's basketball. And now the women's basketball tournament alone is worth like $90 million. Um, and so the FCS uh, – you know, and just a lot of women's basketball and baseball and softball are just, they're not getting the revenue like they should be when it comes to their postseason tournaments. Um, and so my hope is the FCS can somehow negotiate its own TV deal, or even if they are in this lump sum package, again, it's going to bring in tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars in revenue where the NCAA can somehow incentivize FCS teams to stay and have national success, where if you win a first round game, you get, ten thousand dollars if you make it to the semifinals you get a hundred thousand dollars if you win the national title you get five hundred thousand dollars you know because there's millions and millions of more dollars coming into the ncaa um broadcast package through espn and so that's that's something that i hope happens i don't think it will but at the same time you know like i said the the ncaa tournament package has been vastly undervalued for the last 10 years i mean there should be i don't even quarter of a billion more dollars coming into it once the new TV package is signed um, in, in a year or so here. You need to be commissioned for us. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a great stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. Great point because, you know, I've 
you can follow Twitter and social media. When those when those semifinal games and the quarters are going on, when there's really no FBS going on at that time, the bowl games really haven't got going. There, there's a ton of people watching those games all across the country that aren't watching FCS football. So it's a great point because there's no doubt to me these schools are missing out on the money that ESPN's making on those games um, that people are watching. I mean, the, the Twitter banter on that Sac State UIW game last year was just incredible, and it was up. You know, if it was at 1 a.m., people were just blowing up social media about it. So um, it's a great point. Um, we'll wrap it up with like one more question each from uh, each one of the guys, Sam. We'll let you run for the night again. We appreciate you. We're visiting with Sam Herter of uh, Hero Sports, uh, one of the best FCS writers in the country that covers this game and uh, uh, FCS football. Uh, Alan, we'll start with you. With, uh, your kind of your final take with uh, Sam tonight. Yeah, Sam, thanks a bunch again for being with us. As uh, Man, uh, you know, we, we all follow you down here in the south, um, and we, we're always trying to see those rankings and everything come out. So we really appreciate what you do for FCS football. Help you know, grow our brand uh, nationally. And uh, not really a question, just kind of just to, again, want to say thanks for what you do and uh, looking forward to a great season here uh, from Southeastern. You know, I think our perception is better now than it was, you know, five years ago. You know, we've been to the playoffs five years in the last – five times in the last ten years. I have three playoff wins, have wins over Villanova, have wins over Idaho, uh, have wins over Florida A&M, uh, beat Sam Houston in the playoffs. Uh, but we've also had some some losses to some blue bloods. You know, when you talk about uh, Montana and, and uh, we lost to, you know, uh, New Hampshire one year and then obviously James Madison a couple years ago and then a heartbreaker to Sanford last year. But, uh, you know, I guess just kind of maybe one more time, your, your thoughts on where Southeastern's program is. And, and certainly, you know, we, we always talked about getting in the conversation. And when you're in the conversation, you stay in the conversation. And, and that's kind of what, what we feel like we've been able to do the last several years. Yeah, I, I do think Southeastern has has gotten more and more respect, uh, you know, every year where maybe those those first couple of years in the playoffs, you know, it, it was um, it seems like Southeastern, like they have a standout quarterback and then they have a younger guy behind them that plays a lot. And then that standout quarterback leaves and everyone's like, all right, they're going to drop off. But then that younger quarterback steps up and becomes a star. And then, you know, there, there, there's a, another quarterback, you know, the backup quarterback that, uh, that, that plays a lot. Um, and then he grooms into being a star. And, and it seems like this year that is, you know, going to be Eli Sawyer. Uh, but I think, yeah, th those first couple of years when Southeastern was making the playoffs, I think, you know, when they lost some of their star players, star players, maybe the national perspective was, okay, yeah, they, they take a step back, look at these guys that they lost. But now we've seen uh, the Lions reload every year where they are consistently making the playoffs. And so I just think even though there's a lot of, especially offensively, you know, a decent amount of big names gone, um, I think just still the expectation is, okay, we're going to see Southeastern in the playoffs again. We're going to see them right there with UIW. Um, I mean, beat UIW last year and UIW was really good, obviously. And so um, I think the national respect is, is, is there, is it at the level of a Montana state, North Dakota state, South Dakota state, as far as, um, you know, the, the level of talk that, that those programs garner. No, I mean, those, those three programs I named kind of do suck up a lot of oxygen when it comes to FCS conversation. Um, whether that's just national media or whether that's just those fan bases, um, whatever the case may be. But, you know, I do think Southeastern continues to, to rise up and um, has been a consistent playoff team. And now it's just, you know, beating one of those blue bloods. And once you do that, then, then you've arrived and, you know, people give you even more respect. All right, Harris, go ahead. Sam, so the Lions travel week three to Eastern Washington after facing two FBS opponents. Eastern Washington had a down year last year. What What is your outtake on what type of year they're going to have this upcoming season? Uh, and and tell me tell me kind of what you feel about that matchup. Well, that's a huge one because, like we talked about, zero and two start seems you know pretty likely with the schedule. And so uh, you go to Eastern Washington, who was down uh, last year, and I don't I don't think Eastern is going to be a top twenty five team this year. I just don't think they rebound that well. Uh, or that strongly, but but they will be stronger in my opinion. Last year, um, I think they found their quarterback in uh, Kiko v v Vasparis, um, is his name. So I think they will be better. Uh, playing on the red turf is always difficult. Uh, they they play really well at home. Uh, usually. And so that's going to be a big test. I think it's going to be high scoring. You know, statistically, the Eagles were uh, one of the worst defenses in the FCS last year. And so I expect a, a shootout because they have some really good wide receivers on their end. Um, I do have the Lions winning, you know, right now. I know we're, we're three weeks out or whatever, but um, I do think Southeastern will know just how big that game is to, to get, you know, just get a win under their belts. And um, but yeah, I think it's going to be a really entertaining game. Mark. 
I really don't have a question. Just, uh, just really thanks a lot for coming on and making us all smarter and uh, helping us understand the landscape of FCS football and uh, sharing your knowledge with us here tonight. And uh, Just a, a great job overall and appreciate it. would like to have you back as well later on in the season. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Whenever you guys need me, I appreciate it. All right, Sam. Thanks a lot. He's Sam Herter. He is with Hero Sports Bet MGM. He's one of the best and the brightest in covering FCS football. Sam, again, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to continue on and talk about kind of wrap up what Sam talked about. He's going to jump off right now. But, Sam, thanks again. We look forward to reading and uh, listening to what you had to say this season. And uh, hope to talk soon. Thank you, man. All right. Thank you, guys, once again. Appreciate right, it, Sam. Thanks. All right, guys. Well, that was Sam Herter. Um, uh, I'll start real quick. Uh, Alan, what was your takeaway from kind of what he said? Well, uh, I think it – you know, kind of echoes a lot of the stuff that we talk about all the time. You know, I think uh, there's certainly the, the, the bottom line is the perception is that the football is better in the northern part of the country for FCS football because the skins are on the wall. And if we're going to break into that party and we're going to, you know, break into those conversations, then we have to do exactly what Coach Self was trying to do. Go out and schedule these games. Go play Eastern Washington. Play South Dakota State. Got to beat one of these guys. And and then, you know, people around the country, not just in the southern part, you know, not just in the south, start recognizing who you are. And I think that's kind of the point that he, he was making. You know, you talk about North Dakota State, South Dakota State, Montana, Montana State. I mean, they get all the national media because they deserve it. I mean, they, 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 they play great football. They have great fan bases. They have incredible support. And, you know, I think that's just a blueprint of what we're trying to be. Harris, your takeaway from what uh, what he had to say tonight? First and foremost, Sam is super intelligent. I mean, he, he knows everything about FCS football, so that was really awesome to hear him speak and talk uh, and just share his knowledge uh, with the outlook of, 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 of FCS football. Uh, I think he made a lot of great points uh, when it came to matchups and 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 scheduling, um, like Alan touched base on. But uh, I, I would say that my, I guess, biggest takeaway is, yeah, um, probably just just like Alan said, like the schools up north, they they just get so much more attention, and they're not competing with those big FBS schools in their state. So right. they they are the FBS school of their state. I mean, there's there's two schools in North Dakota. So I think that helps them, uh, whereas we're 45 minutes from an LSU. So we have to do a lot more strategic like marketing and, and engagement to get these students and the, and the communities involved here. And then that also helps with recruiting. You know, you're 45 minutes away from a big a big name in Baton Rouge but but you got guys in Texas wanting to go to North Dakota State because they're winning national championships every year because they've made a name for themselves and I think we're getting there and I think Southeastern's making a name for himself uh so I, I'm hopeful the next five years will will be one of those those big fish yeah I mean I'll, I'll give my group and then I'll throw it to Mark to kind of wrap up some thoughts um one of the things that, that stood to me just just listening to him talk is that you know, kind of something I've always thought on the surface is, you know, when are the bodies and fans going to be kind of bored with what's going on? He kind of mentioned that's kind of the case right now a little bit. Uh, I know it's hard to say that when you're winning, but, uh, you know, it's just kind of the way things go. And um, you can kind of make that case for maybe Alabama and the FBS, maybe Georgia's on that path here in the next five or six years. But um, one thing I'll say is that the Lions need to, as a, as a department, as a community, as a university, make a decision and be ready in the next five or six years to, to say, hey, this is the direction the people that we want to play with, McNeese, uh, the Sam Houston's who's already left, uh, UIWs, UCAs, teams we played in the past, SFA, this is where they're going, trying to get with these folks. We got to be ready to make that, that jump with them. Or do we want to just stay back and see what's left and, and play in that league? Because I think Sam has an issue ahead about where things go, and that's just my take is that, We've got to be ready with the financial commitment, with the support and the facilities to, to make a jump if it's going to better and keep our quality of athletics at the highest standard possible uh, going forward. So, um, I mean, y'all's takes on my comment there, uh, well, but, you know, it's, I think, Mark, go ahead. Uh, I would tell you, I don't think we can wait five or six years to be ready. I think we have to be proactive and really should be ready now to make that decision. That decision should already be made. 
Um, now, we don't know what direction FCS football is going to take uh, or FBS football. Is there going to be three tiers of, of Division One football? Is there still going to be two? Is there going to be a middle tier championship similar to the FCS playoffs or how that's going to shake out? I don't know, but those thoughts, th that thought process should have already taken place and we've got to be ready. And now it takes money. It takes commitment, it takes um, donors. Uh, it takes a lot of, a lot of things, it takes fan support, but you either are ready to go or you're not. And, and you're going to get, if you're not ready, you can't just say, okay, boom, I'm going to react to a, a stimulus. Yeah. You've got to be ready. And uh, so, th like I said, those conversations should already be taking place. Uh, there's only so much we can do. There's only so much blood you can get out of a turnip. But um, you've got to decide whether you can push play or, or you got to bow out. I mean, that's basically how I see it. And, Mark, get your final thoughts with Sam and what you gathered from tonight. Well, I mean, Sam's – I mean, I think I think us sitting down with him and, and asking him questions that we've we've prepared and you really see how knowledgeable he is on the FCS landscape. Uh, it's just instant recall. I mean, he can call names off the top of his head with, um, you know, Peyton Award winners and who's hot, who's not around the country. He's, he really has a pulse uh, on FCS football. And it's, it's great to hear that coming from him. And and uh, I thought he had great stuff, had great ideas about, uh, you know, the TV situation moving forward. You know, with his hot takes, I think uh, uh, was very well worth our time having him on and sharing his uh, his views with our fans. I think it's important for people to know who Sam is. I mean, we're, you know, I feel like that we're, you know, and, and I'll just tell you from previously, you know, when I first got into radio with, with Southeastern 17 years ago, and I'm reading scores in the game, you know, of scoreboards around the country, Mark stopped me and said, hey, hey, stop reading about FBS schools or SEC schools. Mindless. You no, know, you know, like read about read about teams in the Ohio Valley, read about the Missouri Valley scores, Big Sky scores. Get our fans associated with the teams that we're competing with, and and you want to, you know, oh, we're making the playoffs. But that that that's why you want to hear from guys like Sam because you want people to understand. I hope people, people watching this tonight will or tomorrow and through the week will start to follow his work and keep up to date. So, like you know, if there's a situation where Southeastern hosts a playoff team at the end of the year. And it's somebody coming in here, our fans will say, oh, yeah, I've heard or, or read about them. And a guy like Sam can give that knowledge throughout the season. Alan, you got something to think of it? No, I mean, no, I'm echoing your point. You know, I mean, we've, we've kind of made that comment for years that, you know, some of our fan base doesn't understand the difference between Houston Christian coming in here and South Dakota State coming in here. I mean, it's a major difference. And, um, and I think that the more our fan base, our supporters, our donors – understand what's going on nationally, you know, and, and this is what you really got to, you know, you got to give credit to our coaches that we've had, you know, you go back to, to Ron Roberts and now what coach Selfo has done is, is really exposing us to national FCS because, you know, Robbie, we didn't know when we started, we didn't know any, about any of this, you know, because we weren't, we weren't following the FCS like we should have been, but what we are now. And that's one of the reasons we find it so, uh, so interesting and, and being able to talk to a guy like this, because, he sees the perspective from a 10,000 foot view of what's going on, you know, in the country. And, you know, sometimes we get secluded down here to our little pocket in, in Southeast Louisiana, but, you know, whenever you're talking to him and he's naming our players and talking about games that we've won, there's people in the country that's paying attention to what's going on here in Hammond. And we have to pay attention to what's going on and we have to realize who we're competing against. We're not just trying to beat Nichols. We're trying to beat Montana. We're trying to beat Montana State. We're trying to beat North Dakota State. We're trying to beat South Dakota State. And the more we all start thinking like that, the better we're going to be. I think you said it best. Like, the fans need to understand, like, hey, the South Alabama game and the state games are huge and they're fun and you want to go in and coach. Those are the least important games of our season. Exactly. That Eastern Washington game is so huge. Like, and our fans need to understand, like, that is the game that – I know it's not here, but, like, the Tarleton game, that's huge. Tarleton, huge. that game is here, and that one's going to be really huge. Uh, well, they all are, but – Well, yeah, but I'm saying, like, those are the games that are massive in this schedule to get to 9-2, and two, get to 8-3. I mean, uh, you know, uh, get lucky and beat one of these teams. We've been doing this a long time. I mean, I've, I've been doing this since 2007. I've seen a lot of FBS losses. So 
it's just not a percentage thing, right? And if our fans are like, hey, we're going to go try to beat Mississippi State, yeah, maybe so. That'd be great. We're, our players are working their tails off all week and all summer to beat them and to play the best game they can. But the games that matter most are these these games like Merle Denny. Eastern Washington and the Catholic Conference game. Well, we'll think back to last year. We're, we're 0-2 and probably couldn't have played worse in the first two games. We had injuries galore. Didn't know what – we were kind of teetering. Didn't know which direction we are going to go in because of injuries. And all of a sudden, we come home and blast Central Connecticut. They came to a perfect spot on the schedule. Uh, carry that over into UIW is – we all saw what they did, go to the semifinal. Should have went to the national championship game. And – uh, beat them and beat them, you know, played arguably our best game of the year, come back and throttle uh, Murray State right. right after that. Now, we did stumble against Texas A&M Commerce, but um, I think that kind of got us right for Jacksonville State because we went in that open date. And that Jacksonville State got us, game got us in the playoffs. Uh, we, we went up there and manhandled them, you know, 31 to 14. It wasn't that close. And I think everybody at that point said, no, these guys are for real. You got a UIW win. You got Jacksonville State that you hammer on the road, who went 9-2, and two, by the way, and also got an FBS win uh, this week with the same players. So uh, that – I think last year we saw how it's done. I, I think from a, from a team standpoint, a team morale, uh, how to get your minds right uh, as far as the team goes and the coaching staff goes. Now we got to get our fans in that, that right frame of mind. So that Tarleton game, it should be sold out. We should have, you know, seven, 8,000 people at that game because they're going to be good. They're going to be coming in here. We got to win that game. So whatever we got to do to get our fans in the stands to um, to back this team, I, I think it's huge. So that's that's my soapbox for today. All right, guys. Man, that was a great episode. Um, appreciate y'all being here. Sam was awesome. We're going to try to get some more cool guests in here uh, throughout the season. I think we got a couple up our sleeve, and I think that's going to be uh, – Really important. Mark, I know we got a – how much longer do we need to get going here, Mark? Uh, we got a couple. We can talk Mississippi State real quick. Um, you know, coming up this week, you know, to open up the season, obviously everybody you know, wants to know about that game. Uh, Mississippi State, 9-4 uh, and four last year, good football team, a lot coming back. They do have a coaching change. Uh, they'll run a little bit of a different offense. Obviously, Mike Leach passed away in the offseason. There'll be a uh, an honor or a tribute to him, obviously, at, uh, at Davis Wade Stadium. I know Southeastern is going to – uh, do some things as well with a sticker on their helmet. I know uh, uh, Coach Selfo had a relationship with Mike Leach as well. So uh, that that game's going to mean a lot to everybody. But uh, it's going to be a, a chance for us to test ourselves against uh, an SEC football team. And where are we really physically? And, you know, obviously you can't go in there expecting to win, but I think, you know, they're going to prepare to win. And I think you're going to go in there and prepare to play well. And hopefully things go your way early and you got a chance late in the second half and, at least to play well and come out uh, feeling good about yourselves. and uh, But it's going to be fun. It's always fun to go play an SEC team on the road and get it out of the way. <laughs> but uh, I think I yeah, it's going to it's, it's be a nationally broadcasted game, too, on the SEC Network. So uh, good opportunity, um, big game. I'm sure it's going to be uh, heavily watched. Just tribute to Mike Leach. And uh, it's a good opportunity for the Lions to really put them, you know, put their brand out there to – a lot of S FBS watchers uh, and viewers to kind of figure out who we are, you know, going into circle. One thing I also wanted to mention that came out this week, if you're, if you're watching this or you know someone when you watch this, who was a member of the 2003 football team, the, the initial team that was the football was being brought back. They are going to honor as many players as they possibly can at the Houston Christian game, which is going to be uh, obviously week four, the first home game of the season after the trip to Eastern Washington. So um, if you uh, – if you September anybody, 16th. Yeah. So if, if you know someone or you are a former player in that year, make sure you're there because uh, – and coordinate with the athletic department. Give them a call. Reach you out of email, social media to get some more information about um, about that, that thing. That's a great thing. I mean, I mean, Mark, it's unbelievable. We're, we're 20 years since football came back. That's not, it. Really is unbelievable. I, I've seen all twenty of them, and um, it's just amazing to see where this program was and where it is now and where it's going. And I, I know there's going to be some facility enhancements coming up eventually. Hopefully, here in the next few years, it's going to really take the roof off this place, and you know, literally and figuratively, and hopefully uh, put us uh, on the map and, and on the staircase to a different level, um, and, and just allow us to stay in that hunt uh, nationally in the FCS, and, hope, and who knows where after that but uh uh it's just really huge how 
Um, we lost out on there a second. We'll add him back in. But yeah, it's just really uh, just to see where we were and where we are now um, is, is amazing. Alan, just your final thoughts tonight. Man, you have no idea what it's taken for me to get on this call tonight. <laughs> I had some serious technical difficulties, lost some power at my house. But, hey, look, I'm glad to be a part of it. Uh, looking forward to to getting down there um, on Saturday, like going up to Starkville, Mississippi. And, you know, I thought Coach Selfo said it best at his press conference. You know, they expect to play well. And, listen, we expect them to play well. That's one thing that we've come accustomed to. Uh, this staff, uh, this uh, this program under Coach Selfo has not laid many eggs. I mean, we've gone in big games and we've played well, and I expect us to do that. Now, does that mean we're going to win? No idea. But, I mean, we're going to go in there and play well, and I think uh, Coach Selfo will have this team ready to go. I'm, ex I'm excited to see some really talented players that our fan base knows nothing about um, really kind of busted onto the scene in these first few weeks. All right, guys. Well, we appreciate you guys uh, being with us. We want to thank Sam Herter again from here on Sports for giving us some time. Uh, looking forward to uh, having you guys watch us and the feedback. Um, awesome. Well done again. We'll try to do one of these again next week. Uh, try to get uh, another special guest on to uh, to chat it up. Um, and uh, maybe we'll get Tom Rinaldi on and uh, and talk to him about yeah. it. Get Tom uh, and Tom. Get uh, both of them. With the real Tom. Well, the uh, other Tom Rinaldi. So, Another great edition of the Southeastern Sports Network visiting with you for Alan Waddell, Harris Field, Voice of Lions, Mark Bildum, saying Robbie Roon saying good night and have a great rest of your day and Lions and the Bulldogs facing off on Saturday. Can't wait for it. Thanks again. Have a good night. Well done, fellas.